So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, I'm going to get my subject. In the beginning, God created. Now, I already gave you Revelation chapter 1, what John said. So if you don't believe what John say, I wonder do you believe what Moses says. Now, a lot of people don't think Moses wrote the Bible, but I believe that God gave the first five books of the Bible to Moses. Now, I'm just telling you what I believe, what the Bible says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Don't you forget this verse. He told you what was without form, what was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the earth was without form. He told you what was without form. He told you that the earth was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we have to understand what God is saying, and I'm going to do my best in the next teachings that I'm going to be doing on a series called The Temple of God. Today we're going to go all the way back and we're going to start teaching on God created the heaven and the earth. Now, when I read Revelation, Revelation talks about a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going all the way back to Genesis, because if you don't understand Genesis, you don't understand Revelation. Now, if God created the heaven and the earth in Genesis, Revelation, he created the new heaven, new earth, then you, somewhere down the line, you got to know, do you know what he's talking about? Because if you don't, then you don't know anything between Genesis and Revelation. Everything between Genesis and Revelation is about heaven and earth. So in the beginning, so my teaching for the day is plainly, God created the heaven with no S and the earth with no S. That's how God started out. Everything God created, he multiplied. Everything God created, he divided, made more of. But he started out singular, the heaven and the earth. All right. Now, with that in mind, what I say to God is, why? See, I'm a person when God say he did something, then I want to know why. Just like when he had me to teach the book of Exodus, uh, and I'm not finished with that, of course. That's in our Bible class whenever we get back. And God showed me why he gave Moses Exodus. And then he showed me if he didn't give him Exodus, he would not understand Genesis, so he had to give him Genesis so he could understand Exodus. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. God told Moses to bring Israel, his people, out of Egypt. So Moses' question is, number one, where did they come from? Who are they? Where are they going? And why are you going through everything you're going to get them there? So Moses found out that the people of Israel were the same people that he was sent into Egypt to bring out of Egypt. But Moses wanted to know, how did they get there? Wouldn't that, would that be a good question? How did all these people get here? So God had to go back and tell him, it was only 76 souls that came down to Egypt with Jacob. But now it's a multitude. And now I want you to bring them out of Egypt and take them into the promised land, or we call grace, which is the revelation of it. But they're going to have to go through the wilderness first because I got to make sure they believe. So we're going we're gonna to go all the way back 
and we're going to show you how they got to be a people. Because everything you do in Moses has already been done. See, there was a deliverer before you, Moses, and his name was Noah. See, I had this same talk with Noah about the same people. Noah had to build an ark for the saving of his house. And also, Moses, there were millions of people during the days of Noah, but only eight people were saved. So he's got to go back and show him all of this, where all of this came from. Now, Adam was the first of God's creation. Don't ever, ever let anybody tell you there was somebody created on the earth before Adam. Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. But he shows you also he created a man named Adam. And then out of Adam, he's going to multiply Adam and Eve and all his children will be multiplied upon the face of the earth until there were millions of people in the days of Noah. But only eight people got saved, and then God's going to start all over again with Noah and his eight people. And then he's going to call out Abraham so he can start this journey of faith. Abraham also was sent into Egypt. And out of Egypt, God brought him out and made him wealthy. And now he had sons called, Abraham had a son called Isaac, the type of Christ. Isaac had a son called Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter. And now these 12 sons have multiplied. And they have come to Egypt. See, he wouldn't have known that if he didn't give him Genesis. He had to give him Genesis to know about Exodus. Exodus means bringing out of. It's time for me to bring them out of Egypt. And God had to tell him how they got there. So we can see the whole story. You got to see, that's what vision does. Vision shows you the whole story. So you will know the story. So I'm going to do my best to, to help you out. But the whole thing is about the temple of the Lord. So when I ask God, why the temple of the Lord? If I go back to God bringing Israel out of Babylon, what was the first thing they had to do? If you look at first thing, when people say they have to put God first, do you understand what that means? So you have to go back and look at what's first. So I'm teaching the temple of God, and we're going to show you that when God brought Israel out of Egypt, when he brought them to the Mount Sinai, we're going to show you what God said. What really was on God's heart from Genesis 1 and 1. So let's go and look at what was really on his heart. Genesis chapter 1. If I go down and look at verse number 26, the Bible says he created Adam. Why did he create Adam? Because he wanted a temple. The temple of the Lord means where God lives. See, the first thing people got to understand is God wants a place to live. And we are saying, oh, I'm the temple of the Lord. I want to be the temple of the Lord. Since, see, you got to understand, you can't get yourself involved if you are the temple of the Lord. I'm going to show you that God lives in, your, in the house. And you can't be dibbly dabbling, if I can say that, in the other stuff. See, you got people who was raised up to try a lot of stuff. 
and they now are Christian or they country did a lot of stuff. But now they're Christians now and they think they still supposed to do that kind of stuff like witchcraft, Ouija boards, voodoo, hoodoo, you do. Name either one. But the key is all that's demonic. All right, the temple of God. Let me give you what the temple of God is about. The temple of God is a house or the dwelling place of God. It's where God lives. See, God lives in the temple. But I'm going to go all the way down to the word of God and show you all the way down to the word of God where God lives. Now, all of those were types and shadows, but what he was wanted to come to is us. Who did he start out with? You got to know why God created Adam. God created Adam so he can live in his house. Adam was the first house that God built. God only built two houses. So you hear the Bible say after a while, when I read you Acts 17, we can write that down. I'm going to show you that God lives not in temples made with hands. Now the first house was Adam. So he's trying to get people to understand that he has now built a new house. This building, thank God for this building, and God knows eventually it will be paid off, but it's not the temple of the Lord. See, the building is not the temple. The building is here so the temple can come together. This is where we assemble. See, that's why a lot of people will sit at home, they think they're doing okay and God's pleased. He's not. You operate against the word of the Lord and want God to be pleased. Now, the purpose that God puts everybody in the valley is so he can bring the bones together. You need to read Ezekiel chapter 37, how it was in the Old Covenant. All the bones was in the valley so God can be able to bring all the bones together and create his body. See, that's why the Bible said we are bones of his bones, flesh of his flesh. We are the same body, the body of Christ. And what happened is you got so many people that say, I'm a part of the door of faith, I'm a part of the body. They'll come here and they'll join and then they'll leave, won't come back. So when they, when they die, they can tell the, tell the coroner, they, well, I'm a member, I'm a member of the door of faith. That's not going to save you. You got people at home and they don't understand. You got to check yourself. That's a part of this teaching I'm going to do. I'm going to deal with called falling from grace. And people really don't know. They, in their heart, they have, they have left the Lord. They have no desire in their heart to go to church anymore. See, that I believe that's one of the reasons God gave us a, a, a year or two year break. Because people had this thing like, oh man, pastor, when are you going to start a church? Pastor, when are you going to open the door? Pastor, pastor. Now the doors are open and they still walk around Sunday morning in their pajamas. <laughs> See, I'm all right. I can watch TV from right here. You know, you just got used to that. That's not what God intended. He really want to know what your heart was. Because if he had a said, the doors of the church are open, you would have come running. See, I know that's going to speak to some of the people out there. I'm not trying to put you down. Some of you got to work. We're not talking about that. But some people are just lazy. I'm serious. They're just plain lazy. And they think, well, God understands. You watch when I teach this message. You'll know God, God not one of them people just understand everything. When you don't do what he asks you to do, they know he understands. Come.
coming to church is something that Israel stopped doing in the book of Hebrews, so I can find this for me. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. He said, from which and some is doing. See, what had happened was they were waiting for the coming of the Lord. That was their excuse. So they stopped going to church. They feel like if the Lord is coming, all I got to do is wait on my rooftop. They had stopped working. See, that's where you get to saying, if you don't work, you don't eat. The book of Hebrews chapter 10, in the verse before that, you want to give me before I start. Hebrews chapter 10. Let, let me show you something. See, the same thing as people going through the day, but the key is we waiting on something else. I don't know what people waiting on. Well, no, we got to wait, wait till the virus leaves. Well, you know that's got to be a lie because everybody in here said the virus is not in here. We do have social distances. And you can wear your mask. See, so you're, still, you're still holding on to something in 2020. But the same people. My wife has a Facebook. I go on the same Facebook. I see them all. There they are right there. On vacation. Nothing about the virus. I mean, they, they heal hither and thither. I mean, they got parties, they got weddings and everything else. There they are right there. Well, Sunday morning, the virus. The virus. No, see, you lying to yourself. You're not, you're not even lying to God. You're lying to yourself. See, I'm going to show you a people. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, right? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, this is what happened to Israel. You want to hold on to that verse 23, back up two verses, Mark in your Bible, verse 23 to 25. Watch what, see, they was, wait, they was waiting for the Lord to come. They just, they had stopped coming to church. Paul said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And then verse 24, let us consider one another. Wait a minute. Let us consider one another. See, you, you at home, what about one another? See, God said love one another as he had loved you. Well, you're not going to do that at home. When you're at home, it's only me, we, and us three. And you got more than that, us four and us five. You're not worried about nobody else. Let us consider one another to provoke to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Now, I'm going to read this same thing in, in the NLT. Not assembling, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the man of son is, Paul says, but you should be exhorting one another. Well, you're not exhorting nobody if you're at home. See, people, uh, people don't, not obey in the word. Exhort one another as so much to more, watch this, as you see the day approaching. See, they was waiting on the Lord to come, so they told Paul, we're not coming to church, uh, we're not coming to church uh, because the Lord's coming. So he said to them, look, forsake not. I want that same verse on, on NLT. Hebrew chapter number 10. And I want to look at verse number 24 and 25. I'm going to get that in my NLT also. We're going to get back to our message. This is just a little. Hebrew chapter 10 and verse number 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act of love and good works. Motivate one another. Well, you can't do it at home. And then it says, let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect. He called it neglect. Now, we don't have Bible class right now. That was Tuesday and Thursday. We're not, we not there yet. We're just trying to get folks back for 9 and 11 on Sunday. 
Now, we got some good folk. We got some good folk who come here at 9, but they ain't coming, they're not coming at 11. We got some good folks who come at 11 and not coming at 9. See, I'm going to show you that's just neglect. He only asks for one day out of seven. See, we don't have to keep a Sabbath no more out of seven. He did all the work. All we need to is take one day and come and worship him and praise him. Just one day for what he has done the other six days. Now, Monday morning coming, and guess where you're going? You're going to work with no questions asked. And you're going to work six days and seven of the acts. See, I'm going to show you what's going on with the temple. And because of how you're treating the temple, you are not being edified. You're not being built up. And the house of God is going to waste. It's just like it would be your own natural house. You're not cutting your grass. I'm not talking about you now. I'm just trying to tell you if you're not, if you're not cutting your grass, if you're not, you got stuff, you got so much stuff that need to be done in your house. Just think about it. In, your, in a physical house, if you go look through every room, every drawer, every closet, everything overrunning. We won't go to your house. Let's go to your car. Because you're the manager. See, all God want to look at, can you manage it? You keep hollering about, oh, Lord, I want a new car. I want a new house. What you doing? Are you managing what he gave you? Well, let's go to your truck. Let's open your trunk up. Look at the stuff that you throwed back there for last how many months? See, you got to understand, it has to do with you managing stuff. So when God come down to his house, he won't know how well can you manage it. Are you keeping it up? God wants you to be here a long time. He wants you to serve him throughout eternity, but he wants you to be here a long time. Are you keeping it up? There's a lot of stuff that you, how, much, how many hours of sleep do you get? We're not talking about our work. Yeah, you, some of you don't even have to work. How many hours of sleep do you get? The Bible tells you, Listen, anybody will tell you who's a good person or know about health will tell you eight hours is a minimum. See, people want to come to church on Sunday morning. Well, I ain't going to be able to make it at nine o'clock. Why? Couldn't sleep at all last night. That's all that was. You're out, you're out and about. You can't, you can't be here in the morning time. I couldn't. I'm here every, every Sunday morning for 6 o'clock for the last 25 years. I'm not, don't clap your hand. I'm not here to pack. I'm just talking about, but I couldn't do that if I didn't go to bed at night. You got to get your rest. You got to get your sleep. You're going to get up next morning and serve the Lord. I'm just telling you what the truth is. I mean, we, we, we got to catch this movie. We got to catch that movie. We got to catch this play. They, they, they're jumping over here, man. They're popping over there. We got to be involved in all that. 1230, 1 o'clock in the morning, still sitting up on the tech, Texan field, playing games. Sunday morning, you can't get to church. See, you got to see what's going on in your house. That's what this is about. I'm going to show you in the word of God that everything that God want to do in your life is dependent on how well you're taking care of the house. His house. Just stop making excuses. That's over. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 10 of the NLT, verse 25. Hebrews 10, 25 of the NLT. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the return is drawing near. See, Jesus was coming, so they was like, well, I'm not going to church. Well, if they wasn't going to church and Jesus came, most likely they weren't going with Jesus. 
See, people today still don't, they, or the, you know, the Lord is coming. Well, if he ain't, isn't that something? You believe he's coming, but you still won't go to church. Now, you know you lying. <laughs> That's what Paul let them know. You're telling me that you believe the Lord is coming, you won't even go to church. He's coming for the church. That's what people say. But I'm here to show you that this thing about the temple is not true. And I'm going to take you from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament to show you that the temple of the Lord is not natural. And yet people are telling believers on Christian television that God got to find some way to get this temple built. And you got folk taking up money, send money here to help get the temple bid. You have been deceived. And then people are telling you when the Lord comes, he's coming back to Israel. He's dealing with the Gentiles now. And then they go, see all this stuff. You've been lied to. You've been deceived. All right. Now, God created the heaven and earth. Now, I want to show you in the word of God. What did God create and why? Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 66. In the book of Isaiah chapter 66, why God concerned about his temple? Isaiah chapter 66. What, why is God so concerned about his temple. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne. Now, you got to understand something. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's telling you what he created first. He's, see, you got to understand something. Old Testament, you got to find out what words are, what, they, what were they. God created the heaven and earth. What did he create first? He created his throne first. Now we have to understand, where was his throne? In Jerusalem. So you have to understand what God's talking about. Because if you don't, you don't understand the Bible. This is what people hear. In the beginning, God created, they look up in the air and say heaven and look down at the grass and say earth. Because that's all they know. God's Bible is not about sky and grass. God's Bible is about a nation called Israel, a city called Jerusalem, a land called the promised land. And he's going to show you how he got from there to Revelation. He's going to show you why he destroyed the old heaven and the old earth. Why did he have to make a new heaven and a new earth? Because the first people who represented heaven and earth were worshiping idols and images and they was involved in witchcraft and voodoo and hoodoo and all this stuff which God hates. So he destroyed them. He no respect to persons. That's why I'm going to show you in the, in the Bible. The Bible says that you if you say you are born again believer and have the spirit of Christ in you, you can defile the temple of the Lord. And the Bible says, if any man defile the temple of God, God will destroy him. Because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It'll be better off for you to go back and live your life in the world than for you to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and his teachings. 
and then go serve Satan, demonic spirits. This is not a game. God is holy. God is jealous. Okay. Now, let's, let's look at Isaiah 66 and verse 1. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne. Now, you need to write that down because in the beginning, God created the heaven. What did he create? He created his throne. The earth is his footstool. Footstool really means where he's walking around. The earth is his footstool. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. So it's just like if he's sitting here in his throne, his throne is in Jerusalem, his feet is out here walking up and down the earth. Do everybody understand that? All right, a king. The king throne is in Jerusalem. That's all God telling you. But he walks up and down Israel, walking and watching his people. So when you say, I'm a Christian, and I'm involved in other stuff, demonic stuff, don't you know the Lord sees that? Don't you know that stuff destroys the temple of God? You're trying, to, you're trying to bring God in a relationship with idols. See, that's why I'm, not, I'm using 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, because it's telling you. Matter of fact, can't, let's read that right now out of the NLT. 2 Corinthians chapter 16, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. I'm going to read this out of the NLT. So all I could do is think, maybe they don't know, Lord. Maybe people just don't know. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt for the Lord spank your behind. So if you get a spanking, you'll be able to say, if the pastor had told me, you won't have to tell him that. Because he told you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. It said, don't team up. Wait on the screen. Verse 14. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Here people are unbelievers. You have to party with them over here. They on the floor getting down. Drinking real beer and whiskey. Smoking real dope. And there you are. Those are my friends. Those are my buddies. Sunday morning, I'm over here with the church. You're a hypocrite. That's what this Bible call you. He call you a whore. People don't know what a whore is. They are male whores and female whores. But all it is is you give up your body to anybody. See, you over here with these tonight, and you over here with us tomorrow, you a whore. You're not committed to nobody. This is not going to be nice. But it will bring deliverance. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. What are you doing there? That's what you got to say. Why am I here? Why do I fit in? Well, those my friend. Well, who are we? How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can people who are righteous, who are God's holy people, be partners with people who are wicked? See, that's what we're seeing on television every other week. That's what we've been, that's what they say. How in the world do I get deceived like this? You partnered with wickedness. 
And now you in jail, you in prison, they on the beach. How many hear what I'm saying? That's what you got to understand. Don't you know that God has already said things about people who are wicked? I, I remember this when I was growing up. There was a guy, he lived next door to us, and he would always talk about there ain't no God and all this. And when, he, when I hear him talking all this stuff, I got away from him. Because my whole thing is, something going to fall on this dude. You know what I mean? I, I'm not going to be with him. Because anything fall, anything will fall on that guy. The way he talk about God in a negative matter. See, you're with people who anything can happen to. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a part of with, be partnered with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? I got me a man. You did the same thing Adam, Adam wife says. Adam said, I got me a man. Don't, real, don't care if he's saved or not. I got a man. See, I'm your pastor. When you get a man, if he's from God, you should bring him here to your daddy, spiritually speaking. Any man that you won't take home to, to meet your daddy and mother, you got a problem. Because you already know mom and dad going to reject them. That's why some people, they get a hug, they get a man, I got me a man. Have you met, have you met, have you met his mother? No, no, he hasn't met my parents yet. <laughs> yeah. Because if that boy or girl was legit, you would take him and let him meet your mom and your daddy. And then you'll be able to say, I'll know it, is they for me or not, because I know mama. Would mama see him, pain hanging all off his butt, drawers all up in top of his back, he gonna tell, listen. <laughs> See, we don't want to tell folks the truth. We, 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 we're different. But I don't think it's we. You have to tell people the truth. That's why in this church, we tell our children, we tell our parents here, don't buy your children clothes that your knees are out, your arms out, butt out. Stuff. What you doing? You wasn't raised like that. We couldn't go to, we couldn't even go to school if we had to hold our clothes. Amen. Don't be conformed to this world. That's what you're doing. Amen. You're being conformed to the world. The world is saying to you, it's all right. Get the one that's, you don't even have to have no butt no more. Just get some long hang down and every now and then your butt is sweat. Just get some girls, okay. How much you pay for them? Double the, double the price. See, they see people coming, so what they do, they just throw them out here and walk all over, trample all over, wash them in Purex, every, Clorox, and get them faded out and cut them all up and throw them in the washing machine and put them in the store. They'll buy them. Don't want nothing new no more. And don't want the pastor to say nothing. The pastor's going to tell you, but what hurts is this, is your children going to learn from you. You're saying to them, this is right. This is how you should dress. As adults, let's be adults. Let's be mature. Let's be grown folk. And stop acting like kids. That was free. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wicked? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be with Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be with God's temple and idols? 
You are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will live in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers. Separate yourselves from them, saith the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. And I will welcome you. I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I love my children, all of them. But I tell them nothing different than I tell you. Am I right, honey? We don't have no, anything we tell our natural born sons and daughters, we tell our spiritual sons and daughters. Is that right? We're not going to tell you nothing different. If my children come home with their butts out, pants all hanging all down, had jaw showing, and you're going to tell me, you think I ain't gonna, I'm not going to say nothing? I represent the Lord himself. I am a son of the living God. See, either you're going you're gonna to represent the kingdom of God or you're going to represent the kingdom of this world. You're going to represent one or the other. You see, what, 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 what the children are seeing, you got to understand, you didn't have this during your day. What the children are seeing, they are seeing a man making a hundred million dollars. Walk around with his behind out, pants off his butt, knees out and everything. And to him, and your little old pants are skinny down. They, to him, he's a millionaire. So your kids see that. And they think that's great. And you got to be able to tell them, look, son, that man has followed the world. He followed his money, but you're going to follow the Lord. You got to make a choice. Now, let, let's, let's look at something here. Uh, believe me, I got, I'm going to be on you for a while, so I'm not going away. <laughs> believe me. Let's go to, let me show you something. We got about six minutes. Let me show you something. Let's go to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai. Now, the best way to find Haggai, for those who don't know the Bible, is go to the book of Matthew and back up. The first book you will get to is Zechariah, and the second book you get to is Haggai. See, I'm not going to prove Your, I'm not going to prove your mess. What do that mean, pastor? See, as your pastor, if it's not right, I don't want a part in it. Let me say it again. When something is not right, I do not want a part in it. When I marry people or do people's wedding, I don't know why I'm on this, but I use it. And you bring me somebody that don't live for God, not saved. See, there's a word called, and I'm going to show you. And this word means the same as a vagabond, a person without a job, a whore. All those words are the same. That's how God looks at them. And here you bring me this person as your pastor. You say, Pastor, this is who I believe the Lord gave me. Now, am I, if, I'm a, if, I'm a, if I'm a pastor, I'm a real pastor, which I am, I'm going to look at you and say, do you think I'm crazy? Now, you may want him, but the Lord didn't give him to you. See, that's why the Bible used the term Joined to the Lord. Because that means the Lord joined you together. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So when somebody come to me and say, Pastor, uh, uh, you, you, I, don't you think I can get married again? 
uh, I, me and my husband got divorced. I said, well, was he saved when you married him? No. Well, God never joined you together. You've never been joined together with nobody. See, we think everybody we marry, God joined us together. God is not going to join together clean and unclean. If a man not saved and you saved, God not going to join you together. Now, you can try to make it work. That's up to you and God. But he's not joining you together. To join you together, what is he going to join? He can't join your spirit because he's saved. He's not saved. You're what he is. He can't join it together. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. That's a temple of the devil. How are you going to join you together? You just want a man. You in heat. It takes your pastor to tell you. And the only somebody can help you is the Holy Spirit. My job is to tell you the truth. If you would, if you would get God in your life, get life, God life in you, he will put the fire, the fire out in your body. Because you in heat. You want a man. And you think that man can, can put the heat out. He can't. You will go from man to man to man because one man can't put it out unless you, is, unless you are married to him. That's why the Bible said marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. You must understand that, that, that what I'm saying. I've done the same thing. I've been there. Only thing getting a woman going to do is cause you to want another one. But when you get a wife, God will have her to satisfy your need. It's not going to happen. And I tell people all the time, well, you know, we be arguing. I say, are y'all married? No, we ain't married, but we've been staying together a long time. Hold it. Staying together a long time don't make you married. Until you meet a man in Christ and a woman in Christ and come before the Lord and make this legal before the Lord, that's not your husband. Your boyfriend ain't your husband. Now, this, this didn't supposed to turn out this way. I, I, I saw none of this. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. So you imagine what you got coming. Haggai. I'm sorry. I'm still seeing her back. I'm looking at her back. Haggai. Now, watch what God said to these people. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it later, but I'm not going to do it today. I don't have time. Haggai chapter 1. And let's go to verse 11. Just in the NLT. Now, these people would not take care of the house of God. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't even build the house of God. They said it's not time. That's the folks sitting on the behind won't go to church. It ain't time. And God says... To, even to these people, it was time to build the house of God, and they told God that it wasn't time yet. And then God said, look, consider your ways. You can read it later. I'm, I'll teach on it later, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you this one verse. Haggai chapter 1, verse 11. Haggai chapter 1, verse 11. He said, I have called for a drought on your fields. See, God, don't, it doesn't make any difference. God shut it all down. I call for a drought in your fields. I call for a drought in your hills. I call for a drought to wither your grains. I call for a drought to wither your grapes and your olive trees. I call for a drought to wither up your crops. I call for a drought, a drought to starve you and your livestock. I call for a drought, a drought to ruin everything you have, work so hard to get. I'm the one called for a drought until you take care of my house. This is not a game. 
God created you to live in you. This is not your house. This is his house. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and God lives in you and you are not your own? You can't do what you want to do with this house. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which belong to God. And you know what? My time is already gone for the first hour. Listen, this is not a game. Come on, stand up on your feet. We're a little slow in here this morning, but stand up on your feet. We're going to give God his praise. We're going to give God his glory. And thank God for a pastor who will tell you the truth. Come on, somebody give God some praise. Thank God. Thank him. Thank God for a pastor. I will tell you the truth. You cannot be saved. I'm going to show you what God really did. I'm going to show you what I don't want to happen to people that have stopped going to church since 2020. I do not want you to fall from grace. That's going to be one of the teachings I'm going to do in this series. That means God already saved you. But yet, you don't want to be saved. You do not want to live for God. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. God has given us everything we need. Won't you receive Christ now? I believe, Father. Christ died for my sins. He was buried in my place. And you raised Jesus from the dead so I can be right with God. Now you got to come and receive him into your heart. Receive the Holy Spirit right now. All to be that prayer, say amen. And the door of faith is open unto you.